you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Dr. John Todd, author of the new book, Healing Earth, An Ecologist's Journey of Innovation and Environmental Stewardship. John Todd is an internationally renowned inventor, visionary, and ecological designer. John boldly travels to places that others try to avoid, toxic waste sites, oil spills, leaking landfills, damaged landscapes, and waterways. Using the tools of nature to remediate these areas, John is an expert in the design and construction of wastewater treatment systems and eco-machines that help to heal the earth. John Todd has been honored with many awards, including a UN Award for Environmental Design and the 2008 Buckminster Fuller Challenge and Prize. Time Magazine hailed John as one of the 35 most important inventors of the 20th century. You can find out more about John and his work at toddecological.com. And welcome back to Sustainable World Radio, John. It's so great to have you back here again on the show. It's wonderful to be back, and thank you for inviting me. I'm honored. Oh, I, I'm so honored. And since we last spoke in, in 2016, you've been very busy. Um, your new book just came out, Healing Earth. I'm wondering why or how are you feeling hopeful in this time of climate disruption and habitat and biodiversity loss? I'm feeling hopeful for two reasons. The first reason is that we now know perhaps for the first time in history, how to go to wounded places and, re- and heal them, how to stabilize carbon in the atmosphere and park it or sequester it into the Earth's soils. The list goes on of what we can't do. I don't think there is a single problem facing humanity for which there is not a practical, useful, and immediate solution. I think one of the most important things that we're coming to realize, and this is the source of my optimism. There's also another factor. When I listen and hear about the young people and uh, and the green economic models being developed and the, uh, the commitment to confronting climate change. It's been so dormant in this country and is now coming alive all around us. That's what has me excited about the future. And that's the source of my hope. Both the knowledge is here and increasingly the will to act is here. This coming together, I believe, is important when you taught at the University of Vermont, one of the mottos of your class was to do good things in bad places. And that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I think is so great. <laughs> that is a good thing. I should just put that over my my um, <laughs> front door. So I see it every day. And that which has been damaged can be healed. And so you have seen evidence and you're talking about all these solutions that are surrounding us right now. And I feel like they are getting out in the media more too, and people are hearing about them much more. And I think it's, yeah. I think it's people like you that are the, the beachhead, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the first wave striking the beach. And, uh, and that, that's the catalyst that makes things happen, you know. Oh my gosh, I've been complimented by John Getting Todd. back to your early question about <laughs> yes. the, the students do good, do good things in bad places. When I started, when I went back to teaching, I taught ecological design. The students were so savvy. They knew, they knew so much, 
and we're so smart. But what I learned very soon into the teaching game was that their training had been almost entirely on what is wrong in the world. And they were almost to a person burdened and anxious, and some were depressed with the knowledge that they were carrying about the state of the earth. And I, I simply said to myself, this has to be replaced with a body of knowledge that allows them to take action and engage in this vast task of healing and repairing and stabilizing climate and feeding ourselves and being more equitable. All of those things falls under this umbrella of ecologically designing our future. And to watch the, the students change, to see their projects in the greenhouse beginning to bear fruit, it was just a wonderful experience for me. I'm so glad I went back to teaching. And really changing that fear into action and working hand in hand with nature, I could see it's so inspiring for people because they're participating in, in the solutions. There were so many organizations and so many entities and so many companies that grew out of that student body. Um, they Almost all of them seemed to be on fire. It was just really exciting beyond measure for me to watch it unfold. Oh, that's wonderful. And you've actually directly experienced um, one of the class mottos, which was, that which has been damaged can be healed. And you say that nature needs to inspire design. And... I would love to hear from you. How can we begin to understand nature's instructions and work in partnership with the earth without making damaged areas uh, worse than they already are? How can we begin to spark that relationship? Wow. Let me give a, a, a simple possibility. Let's say you live in a city and you're, you happen to be concerned about the environment but you don't feel you have any action. What you can do is plant yourself a window box. And in that window box, uh, you can put things you like, like cherry tomatoes and lettuce and everything else. But don't stop there. Also put into your window box the plants that give you gifts. Uh, perennial warm season grasses and sitting there in your box as they sway in the breezes they will be taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere moving it down through themselves into the soil and sequestering it removing it from circulation and thereby beginning a process that it's the same process that you would do if you wanted to stabilize climate on a worldwide basis. In other words, just by changing the equation from the lettuces and the tomatoes to the lettuce and the tomatoes and the warm season perennial grass, you're creating the beginning of a device that is helping solve not only your, your nutritional problems, but the atmospheric problems that need to be addressed. So it, in this case, it's just a simple step, but inherent in that perennial warm season grass that you've planted is a legacy of information about the natural world um, that, you, that you are acting on and beginning the healing process. Um, I realize that's a, a very simple, maybe simplistic example but it does show uh, how one how one can take action. Mm -hmm. Or if you happen to be a suburbanite, um, uh, let your lawn become a polyculture of perennial grasses and annual grasses and weeds and uh, and fungi and all of it, and it'll convert from being something that's polluting the groundwater under your house to something that is 
purifying the water as rainwater flows through and is also sequestering carbon. There are these 101 little starting acts that make people conscious of the opportunities and the options to an ecological designer. And really, all an ecological designer is, is somebody who uses the strategies of an ecosystem, like a lake or a pond or a marsh or a salt marsh or a woods to carry out the work of society. And the kinds of work that you can carry out is vast, from feeding, from creating fuels, from healing environments, and so on and so forth. And your home, if you let your yard just go more natural and let the plants grow, and it might be the site of the next bird convention, which is what... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, it's amazing. I walked out in I walked out in the yard the other morning and I probably 45 birds went flying up into the air and I thought my it's ama- if you leave little habitat areas for them. Exactly, exactly. If I, if you don't mind, I'll go uh-huh. back to your other question, what can uh-huh. we do? I think one of the most catalytic things we can do is to actually buy organic foods and especially locally grown organic foods, because there we're buying from farmers who not only are extremely talented at growing foods, but they're also carbon farmers. These are the farmers who are conscious of the need to reduce carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and find places to put it. So when you buy organic food, you're not only getting uh, poison-free food, but you are you are helping stabilize climate. You're also working with farms that are are uh, creating the kind of botanical support for all kinds of insects. And the collapse of insects worldwide is one of the most frightening things of our time, because without them, um, our options narrow very, very quickly. So there are just so many reasons to say nothing about the the fact that industrial agriculture has the ability to to uh, contaminate wide areas with the chemicals that diminish our soil life and our insect life upon which so much depends. So that that's a kind of action that that all of us should try and take. And I realize the food is more expensive. And what I do in my life is just try and eat a little less so that it works out <laughs> anyway. That's good. That's... I'm not always successful about that, but I, I give it a good shot. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, your systems, um, these living technologies that you have made all around the world, and we're going to learn more about those um, in this interview, but you're really pairing ecological knowledge and your design work with a great um, diversity of life. And if you could just tell our listeners what an eco-machine is and why is this diversity of life so important to include in the eco-machine? And we'll go from there. Uh, Well, an eco-machine is a technology that combines uh, civil engineering and ecological life. Uh, They can be designed to grow foods, They can be designed to uh, treat waste. They can be designed to purify water. They can be designed to repair damaged environments. And I've done all of these things. And in some instances, they can be designed to also provide fuels. So um, so what an eco-machine can do is very diverse and very wide. And it's and they're designed differently, but they all use the same principles. And the principles are this. First of all, the technology has to have within it all of the kingdoms of life, all of the six kingdoms of life, the, the, uh, the archaebacteria, the, the eubacteria, um, the protozoans, and, and the, uh, all the way up to plants and animals and fungi. And what we're looking at when we combine the kingdoms of life, all of them in our designs, 
is basically mimicking or being inspired by the evolutionary legacy of life here on Earth. Life on Earth has never evolved in isolation. It's involved in in complete symbiotic association with other forms of life over the 3.7 billion years or whatever the the uh, age of life on Earth is. Um, and this is very important. It basically says that life is a vast experiment between the different kingdoms of life to solve problems efficiently and to, in the most cases to be run off sunshine. And this being run off sunshine is so important for example, I'll just digress slightly by saying that if you go to a conventional sewage treatment plant, um, besides the mechanical, chemical uh, components to it, the major processes are bacterial microorganisms. And they produce a huge amount of excess carbon dioxide because these technologies have no plants in them, no algae, no higher plants. Seeing a two, two-legged two uh, dog or a three-legged dog when you, no, two-legged dog when you look at a, a typical wastewater treatment plant. So it's all of them together that make a huge difference. The other thing we do, which is equally important, is to ha have parent ecosystems in the design. So if you're designing a, a facility, which is actually the, the the second chapter of my book called The Birth of an Eco Machine, when you design that, you say to yourself, part of this system will be derived from a stream. Part of it will be an analog of a marsh. Part of it will be an analog of a pond or a lake. And then you connect these subsystems together to create a living technology that takes the toxic waste and over a period of sh relatively short period of t time converts these toxins to pure water. Uh, if you left these parent ecosystems out of the design process, you're really minimizing the potential of your living technology to do the job I just mentioned. So um, what the students do, and I think this is very important, is that they design uh, desktop scale uh, eco machines to do various tasks. Some grow food, some treat waste like uh, uh, you know, sunblock, sun lotions, which can be toxic to aquatic life, particularly marine life and see if they can solve a problem at a desktop scale. And even in these tiny systems that the students work with, there are uh, parent ecosystems that make them work. One part you can see is a marsh, the other part you can see is a stream, and the other part you can see is a, a pond within their systems. And this combining sunshine, all of the kingdoms of life, and parent ecosystems uh, is what comprises an eco machine. And then the human steers the device for direction they, they intend. So inspiring. It must have been such a wonderful feeling when you designed the first eco machine and it worked. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> I mean, I had some uh, prior experience and background. I was an oceanographer and I was working uh, on the edge of the sea here on Cape Cod, developing um, semi-tropical ecosystems in greenhouses. And so I began to learn this science of assembly that I wouldn't otherwise have known about. But when it came to the, the birth of the first eco machine, it was really quite remarkable because it was, I designed it to treat very toxic waste that was at a landfill, it had 15 um, toxic pollutants in it that were of extreme concern to the EPA, you know, chemicals of concern. 
And I wanted it to be cost effective so that other people would be interested in following behind me. But the main point was to see if there was a technology that could clean this waste that was an insult to the community that had it. Um, so the first thing that I did was say, the world runs on sunshine. I'm going to make a sunshine-based technology. And so I had these big tanks that were made of fiberglass that allowed the light to go in the sides. And these tanks could then, in in several dimensions, absorb sunlight and become solar. And then I literally put inside those dozens of species from over a dozen different wild places. It was just, I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody in the world could have figured out how to make a system that would deal with those chemicals from scratch. So I just added more and more biodiversity, salt marshes, pig walls in the woods, you name it. I went into it, brought them back, stuck them in the tank. And then I started pumping the waste from the contaminated pond into the first tank and the waste flowed from one end to the other, 21 of these big tanks. And inside the tanks, those literally thousands of species began to co-design, co-evolve, and co-adapt to the waste at each stage. So it was the, the tanks were like beads on a string. And as the water flowed through from one to the other, life within the next tank was co-evolving and co-adapting with the waste at each stage. And, and then finally at the end, which came 10 days later, you have this absolutely crystal clear water where the priority pollutants had been gone, destroyed. The heavy metals had been sequestered up toward the front and only one pollutant was still present in a detectable level and it was removed 99.99%. The there is a very there were, the late Lynn Margulis, probably one of the greatest biologists of the 20th century, and the codis of symbiotic evolution and the co-creator of the Gaia hypothesis for life on Earth. Um, she and her students came to that those tanks and studied them uh, one summer, and they found they recognized the species in the tanks. They'd seen them before, but they'd never seen the communities. They were absolutely brand new on Earth. They had, uh, they were, they were adapting to the waste and recombining themselves in a way that didn't occur in nature, but was occurring in those tanks. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, uh, we were able to make uh, clean water from that fetid mess. Um, you mentioned about exciting moments. That was the most exciting moment for me. And a, a, a Swedish scientist asked me, well, how is it that you knew how to engineer all those food webs and everything? And I said, I didn't. And I don't believe anybody on Earth could. What I did was provide provide the systems with so much bio, biodiversity that nature could use its own operating instructions. And that for me was the big breakthrough, that there are a certain group of principles that if we follow, good things will follow. And in the book, I have a, have a chapter uh, describing the the 12 design principles that an ecological designer um, needs to follow to solve some of these problems we're facing. That chapter was really interesting, and you do, in that chapter, you go into detail about the cast of characters that you have in your biological yeah. palette. 
It, exactly. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I just think what a moment when you that clean water came out and that just opened the door to so many projects that you've done around the world that have helped it people did. and environments. It did. The I- ironic story is at first nobody believed that the results. Um, but uh, in the end, after replication, uh, the technology was proven to really work and to work very well. Is that when you were called a scofflaw? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, think I read that in the book. I've never said that word. It's okay. <laughs> no, neither, neither did I until I saw it in the front page of the Boston Globe. Oh, my. Yeah. How were you a scofflaw by doing this? <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I built the first, the, the, it was one of two, uh, uh, eco machines at a local landfill with uh, some friends and a uh, visiting scientist. We built the system ourselves and uh, uh, started it up and did the work I just described to you. It turns out I then got a fine from the state because apparently only a civil engineer with a PE stamp behind his name is allowed to do it. And in Massachusetts, a scientist is not allowed to do it. <laughs> so I got, I got fine. The fine was finally um, annulled because the head of the US EPA in Washington sent his scientists up to evaluate what I was doing. And he gave me the first uh, Chico Mendez Memorial Award for the work that I did on that site. And <laughs> which of Chico Mendez, for those who are younger, was the rubber tapper who was murdered trying to save the forests in the Amazon. And uh, so I was quite honored to get that award. What an inspirational beginning to your career and in earth remediation. And I would love to talk a bit about some of your, um, what you call instructors in the cast of characters that you use um, the biological characters. And it's amazing that some are so small and they can tackle these huge problems. But I'd love to talk about one that we can actually see with our eyes. Um, And you say that it's one of your most inspiring and influential instructors, which is eelgrass. And I'd love to hear more, yes, about this plant and all it contributes to the world and and what designs this um, plant has inspired. I know that's a lot, yes. but maybe just tell us about why you love this plant so much. Well, eelgrass is, is a, a coastal grass. It's, it's prevalent right here where I live, although becoming less so. And it is, um, it is one of these, almost what you would call a keystone species. Um, eelgrasses have two attributes which are in dynamic tension with each other. The first is that they build ecological food webs. And they do that by, as the currents pass water, flow water by them, they slow the currents down. And when the currents slow down, tiny particles of, of earth and biomass settle out. And so that they create a bottom by the by the, the around the plants which is very conducive to the inhabiting of all kinds of different creatures uh, so a, a, an eelgrass bed will be filled with you know blue crabs bass scallops pipefish um, and all these creatures are in there because the eelgrass is producing oxygen during the day when it photosynthesizes. It is it is creating sediments. It's providing habitat for attached organisms to live on. It does all of these things brilliantly, and they become the eelgrass communities become the nurseries of the oceans particularly the inshore oceans. So lots of fish that that sports fishermen go after may have started their lives in an eelgrass community. They're extremely important, and of course they host one of my favorite creatures, now threatened, the bay scallop, which is uh, perhaps one of the best-tasting seafoods there is. Um, 
The other side of eelgrass communities is that they're also extremely vulnerable. If too much pollution, like sewage, gets into the water, or you know, drainage from septic tanks, they are very, very quickly smothered. And when they smother, when they're smothered by the these uh, filamentous algal growths, um, who simply just use them as scaffolding, um, they no longer function in the beneficial ways that I mentioned. And so they begin to disappear, and eelgrass communities are disappearing where coastal pollution is unchecked, or largely unchecked, let me put it that way. And uh, so one looks at the eelgrass community as the basis for design. I've, I've designed uh, aquaculture systems that in fact are inspired eelgrass communities and uh, both freshwater and saltwater because I use analogous elements in the freshwater systems. But at the same time, if I have too many organisms or too much pollution in there, the whole system can fall apart. So it's the del delicate balance between ecosystem building and having clean enough water to do that in. So it really is important that we learn how to create uh, technologies that will protect our harbors and protect our bays and uh, by tiny little eco machines that go on the, the moorings of boats and under docks and things like that. So that all these little technologies which we, we hope to uh, test and verify over the next couple of years. Um, so it's it's wonderful. It's certainly one of the great inspiring environments. But there are so many other teachers. Uh, just to give you one example, if you go out and you look at trees and you see on the side of the trees these these fungi, these wood rot fungi. Um, they're really quite remarkable, and uh, and they're not they're they are sitting there and slowly degrading the trees so that they they uh, become part of the soil community again. It takes a while, but they eventually do. If you take a half a dozen of the species of those fungi or mushrooms, they're called polypore mushrooms, and you make a little technology out of them and you pass oil-contaminated water over these, uh, over these uh, little technologies made from the mushrooms, um, the toxic petroleum is broken down. In fact, the petroleum molecule is broken down just by the activity of the tiny hair-like structures called mycelia of these organisms. And uh, and there you're there you're making uh, pure water. It's one of the techniques we use on a oil contaminated canal uh, in uh, central Massachusetts. Um, and the list goes on and on and on of the kinds of allies that we can use uh, um, that are just organisms that are pre-adapted to help us solve problems. Um, there's a whole class of plants uh, called halophytes. These are salt-tolerant plants, and these plants are are uh, are are being used to to ecologically green desert areas which have quite saline soils, in order to try and uh, and and prove uh, climate stability in these parts of the world. And you know it's an endless recipe book of 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 living things that are our great friends and uh, and our allies in this effort to uh, heal the planet. I I use it. I call it the great work. 
we have so much to talk about, but we don't, we, we could talk for hours because your projects are yeah. just fascinating to me. And one that I would love to um, talk about, you did mention plants that are um, regreening the desert. I'd love for you to tell our listeners about your project in the Sinai Desert, working with the weather makers, I believe, to regreen the desert and your design um, uses salt water as a main component with domes, geodesic domes. And I love yeah. the image of a fleet of domes marching across the desert, leaving beautiful living systems in their wake. Can you explain um, this project? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, well, well what an image. Um, th this, is, this is very early days for this project, but I'm working with a Dutch group and they chose the Sinai Desert as the place where they wanted to regreen because they feel that area of the Middle East, the Eastern Mediterranean, is a weather crucible, meaning it influences weather uh, it far beyond itself, maybe as far east as India and beyond, and North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. And that traditionally, meaning before it was deforested some, you know, six, 8,000 years ago, um, it was a very beneficial, uh, the Sinai was a very beneficial area, bringing in uh, monsoon winds and rains and keeping a fair amount of verdancy in, in the eastern Mediterranean. And then as it lost its trees and then its soils, the nature of the Sinai changed and it slowly became what it is today, a desert. And they, the weather makers, have discovered that each year the air gets slightly drier, slightly hotter, there are fewer clouds, and it, it is becoming, um, it's moving in the wrong direction if it, the Sinai is to ever be a positive force in climate in the future. So they, um, they, were inspired by the work uh, that uh, John Liu uh, told them about on the Los Petro in China. Here is a vast desert with a fine sand that blows all over great parts of China and is the, is the material that gets deeply involved in the smog over Beijing and other places. In other words, it's a very, very dangerous fine sand. So 20 years ago, the, a, a, the, the Chinese decided to see if it could be turned from a desert to an oasis, it's just a vast, and over a 20 year period, they've done it. And John Liu's film, uh, Green Gold, uh, describes that. Large scale regreening could take place. And, uh, and so what they needed to restart life on the peninsula was to find the sediments that washed down toward the sea. And they found quite a few of them, lots of them, in uh, a lake called Lake Bardawil, which is right on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And uh, the lake in olden times, like the about time of Moses, was about 90 feet deep. Now it's three feet deep, or thereabouts. And the difference is sediments have all ended up. The streams all flew, flowed through that area, and it's filled with sediments. The idea is get the same people who dredged the Suez Canal to uh, come and help them uh, put the sediments back up in the, in the hills and the valleys away from the sea. That whole process involved the plants I mentioned, the halophytes. Um, so that's that. I wanted to find a way in which coastal uh, ecosystems could be established. And I designed what I called an oasis eco-machine. And as simply as I can describe it, they're made up of, first of all, geodesic dome greenhouses. And these structures uh, 
plan is to be 60 feet in diameter. And these structures are set in the desert, um, back from the sea, and inside of them are put these clear tanks, which I told you about on the toxic waste story earlier. Those tanks go into the dome, and they are filled with seawater. During the day in the desert, the vents in the dome open up so the wind races through. As soon as the sun goes down, the vents are closed. And then the next morning, the person who's tending the dome comes and drums on the side of it like he was beating on a bongo drum. And what happens is during the night, the cold desert sky causes, and the warm air inside causes fresh water to condense on the whole inside of the dome. And when he bangs on it, it starts to rain. And we've experimented with this here in, in the U.S. and know it works. And so um, we now have a, a early morning rain. It only lasts for three or four minutes. Uh, early morning rain every day of fresh water. So the next stage in the whole process is to put animals and seaweeds to cultivate in these saltwater tanks so that there's an economy. So you've got fishes and clams and uh, and uh, shrimp and so on and so forth and, and various edible species of algae. And again, the process of raining every day. And then inside, terrestrial plants are planted. You start first with uh, with, a, with maybe a tree in the center, and uh, a tree like a fig tree, which can tolerate uh, quite extreme conditions. And then around the tanks, you plant vegetables like tomatoes and, and, and vine crops. They manage to get their moisture because the sides of the tanks also weep so that's how that all comes about. And then around the tank, you start planting these deep-rooted plants, which are really going to be protect. And so you have this plant fish dome structure. And after four or five years, you've got this ecology. And there are photographs of what it's like inside in the book. And, uh, and then you pick it up, the dome, and leave the ecosystem behind. So if you have a whole fleet of these domes leaving ecosystems behind and economic ecosystems because they're providing valuable foods, then you've got this uh, sort of process across the desert, which is very life-affirming in terms of the of, in meaning of the desert itself. There are so many things we can do, but that's just one of them. It's like a chicken tractor, but more of a, a landscape it's like tractor. a chicken tractor. I love it. Yeah. So a plant like a tractor. Chicken. Well, you know, I, the, the, the reason why I selected uh, 60 feet is because uh, 20 people can lift it up and move it to the next site if you don't happen to have, you know, a small crane or something. Yes. So it's actually user-friendly and doable. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our prototypes of these systems were 30 feet in diameter. But and they were easy to move around. It's so exciting, you know. Um, and for people that want to learn more about your projects, there are a few others that I just want to um, give people a hint of what they are, and maybe you could pick one and say a few words about it. But one of yep. the others that was really inspiring was were the two South African villages. I think I don't know if I'm saying this right near the Plankenberg River, and mm -hmm. which seemed like a design challenge because you had to design almost for invisible technologies. Um, and you ended up using the patterns of nature to transform the whole village into a wastewater treatment complex. Boy, your description of it is pretty darn good. I'm, I'm going to quote you. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, so great. I mean, that was amazing. Let me just, yeah, let me just, uh, uh, I have some uh, South African colleagues, including the woman who's the head of the biomimicry, South Africa, Larry Yanish. And we went to the slums, and they're really unbelievable 
there's a photograph in the book of the the slum langru where we were working and it's pretty depressing um sewage in the streets you know kids playing around sewage uh no trees to provide shade and or food and it, it's just very very depressing environment what we did is to try and create a family of technologies that would allow water and the waste and the gray water and so on in these communities um, to be treated. And at the same time as they were being treated, that the treatment process would also involve, as part of the process, the growing of a a forest, an agroforest, that would provide feeds and shelter in the winter wind. Our challenge that we quickly discovered is that, as in so many places, uh, anything that you bring in to solve a problem gets stolen. So if you have a valve or an electric motor or or copper cable or uh, plastic piping, um, as soon as you put it in, it disappears. And so conventional approaches to, say, this kind of urban uh, engineering just don't hold. So I became fascinated by the idea that so much of nature uh, is based upon dendritic patterns. If you look at a, a tree without its leaves, you can see from the crown down these dendritic pattern where, where twigs become slightly larger twigs, which join with slightly larger branches, and then finally the, the main stem. And so much of what happens, whether it's a tree or in your lungs or your heart or whatever, are these dendrite patterns. And they're, they're very, very efficient. And they're very, very good at exchanging gases and liquids and so on. So we thought, is it possible to design inspired by dendritic design? And we did. And we used little ecological elements that just look like little trees or something. Um that people walking through, they wouldn't see um, they wouldn't see anything but say maybe a little bit of vegetation. That way, the systems would continue to function, even under this constant threat of theft. And so, the waste the village is on a hill, and the waste starts in tiny little rivulets which are connected into slightly larger ones, which are connected into slightly larger ones as it goes down, just as you would looking at a naked tree in wood. And so these flows come together, and whenever there's too much flow to deal with the waste, it bypasses and goes to another one. Again, very similar to many systems that you find in nature. And this way... um, we have managed to get some prototype systems going and testing them and and uh, the idea of using trees that have uh, a number of secondary benefits is also integrated because the one of the key technologies in this we call a, a, a tree in a well technology. And in fact, it is a tree in a well. But in the well is a whole series of various kinds of of rock types and materials and what have you that allow for water as it goes on the hill to be quickly absorbed and treated on its way down toward the bottom uh, where there's a river which is uh, badly contaminated and which we're also working to heal, but that's another story. The more we talk, the more I'm struck by we need to get training centers going, and this could be taught in universities. And if someone's listening and is very inspired and wants to um, get more knowledge in this area of earth remediation, how can they do so? Well, I would say, again, we're going back to Holland, which seems to be um, on the, the leading edge of all of this. In Holland, there's an organization called the Common Lands Foundation. And their goal is to is to train uh, literally thousands and thousands of people in stewardship skills that, that 
that are going to be needed worldwide. And they they have one of their first, they call them camps, uh, in in a quite a remote semi arid area of Spain where the uh where the fledgling uh, earth restorers are working and uh, so they're also planning camps in southern Africa and I, I believe in Western Australia. So that's common lands, and there may be an NL for Netherlands after the the um, website name. That's great. One other project that you, and I'll just mention this and then we can move on to something else, but you were also asked to study mountaintop removal and coal industry destruction. And in the book, you lay out a plan for actually revitalizing and remediating this area. Um, And it involves using warm season perennial grasses playing a role. It's a very detailed and interesting idea on how to help one of the most toxic um, legacies that we have in coal mining. Yes. yes. I, I would say the, the 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 chapter on Appalachia is interesting for a number of reasons. First is that we were able to demonstrate that even on just rocky rubble we can establish an ecosystem. Uh, and how it was done is described. As I worked on the problem of uh, of recolonizing the million and a quarter acres that have been destroyed by the coal mining industry of Appalachia. Um, the uh, One of the things that I began to think is there needs to be new institutional structures to allow us to to engage a rather large landscape and get people interested. And as I began to what what I was doing was I was creating uh, drawings of how the landscape would change over time. You know, what would be planted, what would be emphasized, what fuels would be made, what, you know, all these kinds of things. And I, what are illustrated in the book is the successional landscape, how it changes like a meadow becoming a sh- uh, shrubby woods, becoming a forest and so on that happens in nature. And the same process can be to the landscape. And as I thought about it, then I thought, you know, we need to think of the landscape as having different human and in- institutional structures at each stage of succession so that it's uh, it, it where one would start, say, for example, with organizations who bring people together to devise a financing vehicle for acquiring the lands. And these land trusts would be the kind of first stage. And then after a while, then the emphasis on that piece of land shifts to um, scientists uh, working on ways of healing the land and entrepreneurial uh, companies that maybe are are making biochar to help with the land healing. And so there's this earlier entrepreneurial stage combined with the the scientific activity and then slowly possibly the building up of cooperative systems that allow large numbers of people to uh, participate in the transformation of the land. And finally, um, a uh, kind of a new homestead act. The people of the area who have been working on the restoration um, become the new homesteaders. And they can either do that as individuals or they can do that as groups of one kind or another. The, the important point that I'm driving at is as I looked at the process of going from point A to point B, point A being a bare landscape to point B being a diverse community, making and producing a lot of different things, uh, involved a succession in the structures that tended to predominate at any one time on any piece of land. And this occurred to me that, that, in fact, that would facilitate uh, a project on the scale of a million plus acres. Almost any other system might not have the aggregate muscle to pull the task off. At the current time, I'm 
more involved in uh, other projects than I am in the Appalachia project. But uh, it uh, it's something that haunts me. Well, I really feel that the seven successional stages to regeneration outlined in the book really are like, it's like a roadmap for continued human life <laughs> on the planet. Oh, so. I'm, I'm so, so glad you think that because, you know, I haven't had much feedback to that. What I wanted to do is to try and break the hammer lock of the right, left, left, right uh, divide and and make it a much more nuanced world, uh, the ecological restoration. Mm -hmm. I know we could, it's something we all can participate in. And, yeah, exactly. And we're getting close to the end of our time in the interview, but briefly, um, what have been the biggest challenges to um, continuing on with your work in in earth repair? I really think that the, the biggest challenge has been the lack of dedicated money, especially money dedicated to uh, environmental restoration innovation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the environmental restoration work that's taking place within academic circles is very narrowly focused, very, very valuable, but very narrowly focused. When you, when you say, you, you know, reestablish a desert or something, yeah, there there just aren't very many vehicles uh, available, financial vehicles. Um, I would say that's one of the biggest problems I face on an ongoing basis. I wonder if that will change as the direness of our situation becomes more and more apparent. I suspect it will. We hope. I definitely expect it will because um, there are certain kinds of money who, for a, a really important cause, are willing to take risks. And I don't know that money, but I know it exists. And uh, and uh, I think that's what we're counting on. So that's my hope. Yes. And people can find you online at toddecological.com. Yes. And then also, where can they um, find your book? It depends on where they are in the world, it's distributed by uh, Penguin Random House in the Far East, in Australia, New Zealand, and parts of Europe, but just uh, Amazon or, or uh, the local bookstore. But I, I should also say that uh, our nonprofit, Ocean Arcs International, uh, publishes a, a magazine called Annals of Earth. And... Uh, that can be located at www.oceanarcsint.org. Is there anything else you'd want to share with listeners today? I just want to, to, to say, um, by way of concluding, I started out to write this book six years ago. Um, I wanted it to be a memoir so that people could see that it's a, it's a very human enterprise and and how one's childhood very often influences what one does today. And I also wanted it to be a manual, which we've discussed today, so that people could have a sense of how to proceed to think about doing things. And then the the third and final thing is that I really would love Healing Earth to be a really a call for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to commit themselves to this incredible task uh, that the world so badly needs and at the same time it's our duty to think of our children and our grandchildren and get on with it. Thank you so much, John, for being um, here with us today and inspiring us with your words and your um, actions throughout your life and healing the planet. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to me.
Oh, well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening.